We've covered vinegar and acetic acid, so let's make some glacial acetic acid this time, which is basically acetic acid with no water or technically less than 1% water. Some brief information. This was first made and perfected in 1847 by the German scientist Adolf Wilhelm Hermann Kurb. It's now made by the carbonylation of methanol using a rhodium iodide catalyst that was discovered by Monsanto in the 1960s. Glacial acetic acid has a pretty low freezing point at 16.6 .6 degrees Celsius or 61.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Its boiling point is 118 degrees Celsius or 244 degrees Fahrenheit. Its flash point is 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course is relatively low, and it has a pH of 2.4. It's used in producing vinyl acetate, I think cellulose acetate also, plastics, dyes, insecticides, and photography chemicals. As a solvent, it is used to disperse oils and to dissolve sulfur and iodine. Of the several methods available to make glacial acetic acid, I'm going to be using the anhydrous sodium acetate plus 98% or concentrated sulfuric acid. The equation for this is H2SO4 plus 2 sodium acetate minus water anhydrous plus some heat yields sodium sulfate in A2SO4 and two acetic acids, which is glacial acetic acid. To make it properly, we have to have anhydrous sodium acetate. And the equation for that is really simple. Sodium acetate with the three waters electrochemically bonded to it with some heat yields sodium acetate and water, which is evaporated. So you're left with just the sodium acetate, which is anhydrous. The heat that you apply is around 150 degrees Celsius or 302 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three hours. This is easily done in most conventional ovens. So the materials we need is 98% sulfuric acid, 113 milliliters, and the sodium acetate, 75 grams. Essentially for every one gram of sodium acetate anhydrous, you need one and a half milliliters of H2SO4. So if you work this out, this is actually 112.5 milliliters, but I'm going to call it 113 here. When you mix these two together, you get a very exothermic reaction. And in the experiment we're going to do, we're going to only had, add heat later on in the experiment because it is exothermic in the beginning. We also need a distillation kit and an addition funnel. In our methods, make the anhydrous sodium acetate. And number two is set up the distillation. So this will be set up like a traditional distillation with the uh, sodium acetate being put on the bottom here. And this, of course, is the addition funnel, which will have the sulfuric acid up here. And then once you start to drip this in here, this will indeed undergo an exothermic reaction and heat up quite a bit. Once that's done and you've added all your sulfuric acid, you want to remove the right here, remove the addition funnel and replace it with a thermometer. Once you have the thermometer in place, you can start to add additional heat down here. If you keep the hot plate at 250 degrees or less, you'll be um, in a position whereby when this stops boiling, you'll have put over all your sodium acetate. And the reason is what would be left behind in here would be extra sulfuric acid and or sodium sulfate. And if you look over here, the H2SO4 is 337 degrees Celsius and the sodium bisulfate boiling point is 1,249. So these are below the 250 here. So only the acetic acid will have come, on, come over. When you do start to heat this, you want to monitor the temperature. When it's around 112 to 115, you want to get rid of this little beaker right here, which I'll be using at first, and put on actually a 250 milliliter round bottom flask. The reason this is here is that once you hit 100 degrees Celsius, you'll bring over some water. So if there is any water in here, hopefully everything's anhydrous, but if there is, it'll come over before. Once you hit these temperatures right here, you've pretty much gotten rid of the water and you'll be collecting only acetic acid or glacial acetic acid. Once you have the round bottom flask put on right here, you run this as a typical di distillation. There will be a thermometer up here and you just run it until it's done. Like I said, when it stops boiling, you'll have to uh, put over all your acetic acid. What will be left in here will be excess sulfuric acid and the sodium sulfate that we just talked about over here. Hopefully we'll have our glacial acetic acid. And finally, we'll take our glacial acetic acid and experiment with it. So I've covered everything. Let's go make some glacial acetic acid. This right here, I'm moving around there, is the 180 grams or so of the sodium acetate trihydrate that I made a couple weeks ago. But we're going to try and make some glacial acetic acid here, and it can no longer have any hydrate. So we're going to dry it out. I'm going to put it over here in this pan, and we're going to put it in the oven around 150 degrees Celsius, but um, 
I know from experience, I'm going to bump it up to about 310 Fahrenheit, which is like 153 Celsius. It just goes a little quicker and dries up a little faster. I chopped it up a little bit so it could be spread out in this pan. In it goes. I'll check on it periodically. 30 minutes in, everything's melted. One hour in and we're starting to lose some water. 90 minutes later and we've lost a lot of water. There is likely some on the bottom still from experience, so I'm gonna keep heating this. It's been just over two hours and I'm gonna check the bottom of this real quick. Yeah, it looks like all the water's gone. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna break it up next and we'll weigh it. I've done this several times and this happens every time these little stacks grow when it loses its water. Right there and over here you can see this big mound in the middle. Anyways, yeah, it's just interesting. So it's time to break down these little tiny spires you see here and see how incredibly soft and mushy and very low weight. So anhydrous sodium acetate is powder, which is fine white powder. All right, so I'm gonna break this up completely here and I'll be back when it's crushed. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and weigh this. Try not to lose much. We have 107.61 grams, but there is some left on the pan here. So I'm gonna go ahead and scrape that off off camera and then we'll weigh it again. So I finished scraping what I could out of here and I'm gonna put the rest of that in our little bucket here. So you can see how it looks. It's not perfect, but got most of it, maybe a hundredth of a gram is left in there, I'm guessing. We end up with 110.96 grams. To correct myself, it just bounced up to 111 there. So if we take 111 grams and we divide it by 180.6, which was our original amount, we get 61%. Um, and we're left with 111 grams, which is more than we actually need to make our glacial acetic acid. So I started to set up the distillation uh, apparatus for making this glacial acetic acid and uh, something happened and occurred to me right then that hadn't until I saw it and that's that this standard 2440 glass coupling will not fit on top of this. Yep, so that's definitely not going to happen. So I almost gave up but I happened to think of using a rubber stopper, drilling a hole this size on top here and drilling a smaller hole for that and then putting um, this tightening band around there. So it does fit. It is really tight and I'll tighten down even more using some uh, silicone uh, lubricant. And then this fits on the bottom here nicely. And hopefully with the pressure with the clamps on the posts that I'll be using, is gonna hold this all together nicely. So I finished connecting these. I put the uh, silicone grease on there and tighten that band down and they are really held together well. So I don't think I'm gonna have any problems there. The problem comes in because I only have two addition funnels. One is 50 milliliters and the other one is 500 milliliters, this one here. And because I plan on using 75 milliliters of uh, sulfuric acid, there's no way it would fit in the 50. And hence we have this monstrosity up here, but I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Of course, it's just really unusually large. All right, I'm gonna put stuff in here. 75 grams of anhydrous sodium acetate, pre-weighed. 113 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid, pre-measured. 100 milliliters right there and 13 milliliters right there. All right, everything's set up and ready to go. The anhydrous sodium acetate right there. Up here, the sulfuric acid, the distillation set up, of course. And down here, I have a 100 milliliter uh, beaker to collect everything up to 115 degrees Celsius, at which time I will swap that out for that 250 milliliter round bottom flask right there. All right, so I'm gonna add the sulfuric acid here. I'm gonna put in the 12 milliliters. I'm sorry, 13 first. And here goes the 100. The reason I'm adding this first is because if there's a leak in my addition funnel, I don't want to find out when the anhydrous sodium acetate is already in the round bottom flask. So this way I can add this, make sure everything's secure, and then add the dry powder. And there we go. When the acetic acid is coming over, it's going to produce fumes, which would come out that little nipple there. So I just added that tubing there so that it will go up through here, out that spout, and up into the uh, hood there. 
The reason I'm doing that is because it can be a little bit uh, irritating to the eyes and nose. Adding the anhydrous sodium acetate. done. I grease this up with a silicone lubricant and put it in there. That's the last piece that has to be placed anywhere except for this little plastic clip which is just to hold this on tight while the reaction's going. I'm going to start adding the sulfuric acid dropwise and of course remember this is an exothermic reaction and it will start to heat up very much so on its own. I will not be adding any extra heat until all of the sulfuric acid has been added, as I said before. First few drops are starting to come in. All right, I'll be back. Maybe 25 milliliters of the sulfuric acid has dripped in, and it's not dripping down the center because I think this is not lined up perfectly. You can see how it rides the back of the glass right there and it's really collecting back here. So it'll take a bit. I think it's going to soak from the bottom up. You can see evidence of the exothermic reaction with all the steam that's starting to gather on the inside of the glass. Over half of the sulfuric acid has dripped in. It's been about 15 minutes and you can clearly see in the middle there's a dark area. It did soak from the bottom up but it is reacting of course. I'm guessing there's 15, 20 milliliters left or so, and down here it's really heating up quite a bit. We're almost to the point that we take off the sulfuric acid, the addition column here, and put on the thermometer. All of the sulfuric acid has been added down there, and so I'm gonna turn this off. Now I have to separate this coupling to put on the thermometer. I'm gonna do that off camera because I need to move around a lot. So when we come back, I'll have the thermometer right there. The thermometer is in and in place. Everything else looks exactly the same, of course. So I'm gonna test once it he starts heating up here and collect everything up to 115 degrees, which will collect in this 100 milliliter beaker, as I was saying. Any extra water that might be in there will come over hopefully then. So when it hits 115 and the acetic acid comes over, it's pure or glacial. So one last thing, that is obviously a metal tip thermometer. It's stainless steel. And before people complain, I've tested this thermometer in both hot sulfuric and nitric acids and looked at it very closely under a magnifying glass. And it does not appear to be pitting or breaking down in any way. So I think it's good. It, unfortunately, my glass thermometer broke. So this is what I've got right now. We'll see how it goes, but I think we're going to be okay. If I keep the hot plate around 200 degrees Celsius, we will bring over the acetic acid and nothing else because both of the boiling points of sulfuric acid and sodium sulfate especially are much higher than 200 degrees Celsius. So since I started, about almost an hour has passed and as you can see, most of this has liquefied. You can start to see the acetic acid fumes collecting there. There's water in there, of course. This is only at 105 degrees right now, but I just wanted to show you that vapor is sort of swirling around there. We're starting to get uh, liquid coming over on this end. The thermometer is at around 107, so I'm going to toss all of this like I've said so many times. Well it's boiling rapidly now. It's been about an hour and ten minutes so it just took off recently but everything's looking good so far. So the thermometer has crept up to 110.5 uh, then it dropped down to 105 and then it tends to go up again. I'm not exactly sure what is happening however I think about 30 to 40 milliliters has come over on that side so far. So I'm gonna call it quits here and switch that uh, quits with the uh, collection on that and I'm talking about and put on the round bottom flask. This is still boiling. It's been about an hour and a half now but nothing is barely coming over. I mean, a drip every, I don't know, 30 seconds. So what that means, especially because the temperature is coming down here, is that the acetic acid is almost all boiled out. So I waited another half hour, almost all the boiling has stopped and nothing is coming over at all. The temperature of the thermometer on top is at 92 degrees Celsius and it's kind of been staying there. So with those high boiling points of the other things, I think we're done for sure. I'm gonna turn this off here. 
and I will take out what's in the round bottom flask and we'll measure what our yield is. I just turned it off and you can see how dark the bottom has become. All right, let's pour this out and find out how much we made. I'm hoping for something between like 45 and 60. Pretty broad range there, but I'm talking milliliters, of course. Uh, looks like I should have used a 100 milliliter there, <laughs> but guesstimating from this, 50, 1, 2, 3, I would say that's like 55, 56 milliliters, so right in the range. Excellent. The first thing I want to test with our brand new glacial acetic acid is its flammability. I'm going to pour a little bit in this shallow glass dish here. And let's see what happens. I think it's lit. I can't tell. Turn the light off here. Do that again. Seems like it wants to. For sure. Well, there we go. Oh wow, look at that blue fan. I poured just under half of what was left in the shallow dish here again. This time I'm putting a dirty penny in there. Vinegar cleans dirty pennies real nice. Let's see if this does it even faster. All right, well, it's been about 12 or 13 minutes here and it changed a really dark green color. So I think what's happening is it reacted, the acetic acid reacted with what's on the surface. And wow, sure enough. Whew, I'll tell you every once in a while this acetic acid comes up to my nose and it's potent. There you go. Not bad. I know in vinegar it would take in a lot longer. And lastly here, since it is glacial acetic acid, we need to make it glacial. So I've got a little test tube here. It turns into glacial acetic acid like into a solid around 63 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I'm just going to put a little bit in here. And then I'll stick it in my fridge down here. There we go. Put a cork on it. All right, gonna place it down here for, I don't know, it won't take long, 10 or 15 minutes probably. I left it in there around 20 minutes just to be sure. I'm sure it's below 63 Fahrenheit right now. Let's see what happened. Sure enough, there you got it. The glacial part of the glacial acetic acid. This has been cooling down for a couple hours now, and you can see the crystals of the sodium sulfate in there nicely. Unfortunately, this is a mess, so I'm not going to save it, but just wanted to show that to you. Real quick, I just wanted to show you the thermometer in the end that was inside, of course. It's in perfect condition. You can't tell through the camera really well, but it is. So this thermometer in particular survives really well.